Juan Fonseca from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia in Bogotá. Uh, he will be talking about unique continuation principles for the dispersion generalized Benjamin Ono equation in weighted subvolved spaces. Okay, uh, thank you, Pedro, for introducing the conference. And first, I thank uh, Felipe and Hermano for the invitation to participate in this Congress. Uh, second, well, uh, let you know that this is a joint work with uh, Felipe and Gustavo. And, uh, well, this dispersion generalized Benjamin Ono equation, uh, it's uh, one equation where the dispersion uh, has a non-local uh, derivative, which is given by D, the homogeneous derivative D to one plus A times the uh, local derivative, partial derivative respect to x. So uh, in Fourier transfer, basically, we have the symbol for the dispersive part being this uh, non-smooth uh, expression, OK? And well, in the references we uh, consult, we notice that uh, one of the applications for this general nonlinear uh, dispersive propagation of uh, waves there, uh, there is one with vorticity waves in the coastal zone. And what I will mention so far is that this is kind of an interpolation between the KDV equation and the Benjamin Ono equation. And many of the features I will tell about uh, already were uh, given by Didier in the lecture in the morning. So I will just move uh, faster than uh, what I planned before and that will give me some time to uh, go through some details in the, in the proof. So in the case I equals one, you see that we get the KDB equation. And in the case that A is equal to zero, you get the Benjamin Ono equation. So both are well-known models for propagation of unidirectional waves. And they have some uh, properties in common, which are that they have multi-soliton solutions. They can be written in Hamiltonian form infinite conserved quantities uh, are valid for the flow, and they are completely integrable systems. So uh, these uh, were also were given for the uh, Kamasa Holm equation uh, in the lecture in the morning as well. And uh, we consider initially some information about uh, the solvability of these equations in the HS scale. That means the usual solvable spaces. And we understand locally well posed and globally well posed to have the properties that there is a unique solution that uh, persists in that solvable spaces and that we have the continuous dependence property. And if it's valid for all times, then the problem is glo globally well posed. So partial list for KDV equation, I just mentioned a few of them. And just the uh, Let's say that the latest, latest result was due by Guo that uh, got to the endpoint minus three fourths, the global well postness for this KDV equation. In terms of the Benjamin Ono equation, I just mentioned the one that was recently obtained by UNESCO Koenig, where they obtained the local well postness in L2, but because there is a conserved quantity in L2, then you have a global well postness as well. Okay, so um, I mentioned some similarities between the two flows, and now I mentioned that there are uh, two main differences in between them as well. And the first one is related basically to the non-smoothness of the symbol. In the case of the KDV is C to the cube, which is, I mean, the polynomial is completely smooth, but uh, for A less than, than one, between zero and one, uh, we don't have even C3 continuity. So that uh, might reflect the fact that the flow is not uh, an smooth application. So it's not even C2 as was shown by Moline, so and Svekov, and not even locally uniformly continuous. Uh, that means that in particular, uh, we cannot use the contraction method for the Benjamin Ono equation. So for its solvability, we have to rely on compactness arguments and uh, energy type estimates. 
and well, this is not certainly the case for the KDB that, I mean, we use the Picard iteration. And the second difference, the striking difference, is that uh, the KDB flow preserves the Schwartz class. I mean, if we start with initial data in Schwartz class, I mean, the solution keeps forever in Schwartz class. That was uh, resolved by Cato. And for the Benjamin Ono equation, uh, you already established around 86 a result that uh, says that not even the, the polynomial type decay is preserved. His result is uh, valid for integer values of the decay, as we will be clarified in uh, next transparency. And it was recently extended to fractional values of the decay with uh, Gustavo. So in our case, that means the dispersion generalized Benjamin Ono equation, we have uh, local well postness in those sub-level spaces up to L2 in the work by her UNESCO, Koenig, and Koch. So we have the global well postness as well. But it turns out that the, the, the behavior, the qualitative behavior of the dispersion generalized is closer to the Benjamin Ono equation rather than to the KDV. In particular, there is still the uh, map uh, from initial data to solution uh, is not uh, C2, okay? So that means that uh, we cannot use the Picard iteration for solving that problem. And regarding the conserve, the conserve quantities, well, we don't have infinite conserve quantities. Uh, we know that there are at least these three quantities and in particular, the first one, which is the, the conservation of the mean value of the solution, it will be important in our arguments uh, and also the L2 conservation law, okay? So we also consider the traveling wave solutions to get some uh, information about uh, what we'll present as the main theorems. And regarding those, well, we have these uh, ground states which provide the traveling wave solutions. For the KDV equation, they decay pretty fast, so they are in the Schwarz class. It's a secant, hyperbolic secant, and, well, they are unique. And we see the difference between these traveling wave solutions and the ones provided uh, for the Benjamin Ono equation, which you see they have mild decay. And th there is also uh, uniqueness up to symmetry. So in the case A between 0 and 1, uh, there is an explicit formula for those traveling wave solutions, but uh, it was shown that there exist those and they are unique. And that was a recent result by Frank Lensman. And there is a result by Kenick, Martel, and Rubiano where there is an upper limit for the growth of those uh, traveling wave solutions. Well, this is for the profile, of course, of the traveling wave solution. And just notice that uh, the growth here, I mean, it increases linearly with the uh, power A in the dispersive part. So in particular for A equals zero, we get back to the uh, traveling wave solution for the benjamin Ono equation. And therefore, uh, I have to introduce these weighted sub-level spaces because uh, the uniqueness result that I am going to mention is related to those weighted sub-level spaces. So we have here the regularity measured in the HS space and the decay measured in L2. So we have uh, another space that is uh, with one more restriction, which is that the mean value of the function is zero. And that's uh, a natural space when considering this dispersion generalized Benjamin Ono equation. So regarding well postness, well, persistence of those solutions. Uh, we got uh, with Felipe and, and, and Gustavo these results that basically states initially that uh, under this restriction on the regularity, you see respect with the decay, we have for this range of the decay that the solution persists in that space with no extra condition, okay? So we have a solution there for uh, T positive. Now, if we go farther in the range of the decay, that means past the phi halves plus A to this range, then there will be solution, but you have to require the mean value of this 
initial data to be zero, okay? So that's a natural requirement for this problem. And actually, it was shown that that's a necessary condition as well. So yeah, it's a sufficient condition, but it's also necessary. That means that if you have a solution that lives at two different times in that space with this decay, this appropriate decay, phi half plus A, then the solution must have a mean value zero. That means the Fourier transfer at, uh, at zero is exactly equal to zero. So in that sense, this, this is a sharp result. And well, the comments is that we already got the same result for the Benjamin, uh, that means in the case A equals to zero, that the Iorio's results uh, are the ones obtained for this integer value r equals two and r equals uh, three in last theorem. So you see in these two expressions. And also, well, the fact that this establishes an upper growth limit for the decay. So if the initial data doesn't have a mean value zero, then we might not get uh, well postness there because I mean there won't be a solution with that decay for a short time. So you see that we in part C we say that if at two times is there, then the mean value should be zero. So we have the sharpness of the result. Well, regarding the uh, unique continuation principle, you notice that there was an interval that was split up in two pieces, before five halves plus A and between this number and seven halves plus A. So the natural question is what happens uh, after seven halves plus A? So we have that if the solution lives there at three different times, then it must be zero, okay? There is no chance to, to live there anymore. In particular, uh, well, this says that actually part A is, uh, part B is, is a sharp result. So we have this, uh, exactly the same information here. And well, we will consider just in this uh, short sketch that I will show you uh, one of the cases that means with this regularity and the value of A between one half and one. Actually, it will be open in one half. So uh, there is also a natural question. Can we drop the requirement to be in that space with that decay in less than three times? That means at two times. And the answer is, is no. So in that uh, regard, we have the second result. Then with uh, some regularity and assuming that uh, we have an initial data in this space, then it can be shown that there is a time, T star, that we actually give an explicit value for which the solution is still is there. And it's easy to notice that this A is actually greater than, than the value A. So uh, in that sense, it tells us that, uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the answer was negative because you get at two times the solution living in that space and the solution is not necessarily equals to, to zero. So this is a situation completely different to other models that are well known, like, uh, well, the KDB itself, the semi-linear Schrodinger equation, the kamasa holm and, and the KP2, and maybe uh, other ones that already got some uniqueness continuation results with information just at two times, at two different times. Now I will move on. Well, this result was also obtained for the Benjamin Ono equation. And I will mention now the main ingredients for the proof. So we consider just the uh, derivative in the HS space in Fourier transform, so this multiplication by this symbol. And also it will be useful to consider a, a chi function, which is a cutoff function that will localize the singularity of the symbol, of the derivatives of the symbol uh, at zero, that where the problem shows up. And also it's important to uh, 
avoid working just with the homogeneous derivative in the Sobolev space. We will make use of this point-wise derivative that was in the works around 61 by Stein and in the case Pacols too by Dieser, Sonjan, Smith, where you have an equivalence in the size of the HS norm, or in this case the HB norm, of a function, but you have a point-wise expression for that derivative. So under this restriction, we are going to consider just the case n equals one in our situation, and with this regularity between zero and one, so to have uh, B derivatives in LP is equivalent to these two expressions B in LP. So that's pretty much useful in our, in our argument. So with this uh, new derivative, new point was homogeneous derivative, we have for p equals two a uh, nice product rule that will work out pretty much well with the group that is associated to the equation. And well, this is just the equivalence between the two derivatives in, in terms of the size of, of both. So there is another lemma because we're going to work with weights and regularity so at some times they missed, uh, we get that missed. And then this interpolation, this complex interpolation inequality allows to separate them. So this is just really what is telling us this expression. And also for that homogeneous derivative, we have this nice behavior. It's like if you have a positive, uh, positive power, integer power for a polynomial, I mean, every time you take one derivative, then you subtract one from the power. So this is almost telling us the same, uh, let's say this expression, you take theta derivative, so you get the power alpha minus theta, more or less. What is important is that even we have some singularity here at the origin that doesn't happen here at infinity when this eta is greater than, than one, you see that it has L2 integrability, is that uh, an easy analysis shows that this expression, whenever you have this sort of expression uh, localized at the origin with this that is close to the symbol that we are working with, then is in L2 if this uh, restriction is satisfied. So you get that integrability, okay? So not for every power this will be L2 integrable, but when this is satisfied, you, you, you get it. And at some point we were going to rely on this uh, equivalence. So uh, one remark is that you can in, in this expression, plug into the signum function. So one for C positive and minus one for C negative. And uh, I mean, it works exactly the same. And well, this is natural from the symbol that we already mentioned because at some point you get the signum. Okay, well, this is kind of a lengthy expression. And of course, I won't show you all the details for this long expression. And I just, uh, well, mentioned that the worst terms in terms of regularity of this, which will be basically the fourth derivative in Fourier space of the group applied to initial data U naught. Then when you compute that fourth derivative, all these 11 terms showed up. And then these two might be considered the worst terms in that sense of regularity of the symbol. You see, this might not be L2 integrable. So the point is that uh, you are going to use the L2 integrability of the expression with uh, some fractional derivative here, and you have to guarantee that, I mean, to get the unique continuation principle. This seems to be better, a little bit better, and actually what I will show is that this term can transform somehow into one that is close to this one. So that's why they are both in, in red in that expression. So the sketch of the proof goes uh, basically, well, we have three times where we know that the solution uh, fall in that uh, space with that decay. And as I mentioned before, we consider the case when A is between one half and one. So remember that the, the cutoff value was seven halves plus A, so this turns out to be something a little bit more than four, and of course less than five, so, but especially the fractional part of the derivative that we have to use here is just this alpha between zero and one half. And therefore, that's why it's necessary to compute four derivatives because in Fourier space, that decay transforms into differentiation. So we are going to use that the, the solution that we have satisfies the Duhamel formula. So this is 
the expression for the solution. And well, in Fourier rate space, you just take Fourier transfer of that, you get this exponential I already mentioned, and the integral part with the nonlinearity, which is a quadratic uh, C, well, uh, this Fourier transfer of U squared, or, well, equivalently. And this is the group associated to the flow in that case. Therefore, you see here, remember the K is differentiation in the C variable. So this is what we get for four derivatives. But remember that we have to still use the fact that we have alpha derivatives for this expression in L2. So we end up with this lengthy expression here. This is the hypothesis of the solution that we have. You see that we are a little bit below the scale saving house plus A in the K. That means there is something positive that we can plug into the expression. And in Fourier transfer, well, this transform in regularity. And the regularity that you use is just the decay. So at three times, you get with the decay with no epsilon at all. So we, got, we have this regularity, 7 half plus A, which is 4 plus alpha, OK? Because this value of A is between 1 half and 1. At just at those three times. Well, uh, this is main points. Well, uh, it should be plural because this is one of the points that we have a nice expression for the evolution of the first momentum. So if you start with the differential equation, you can see that the first momentum of the solution just uh, is equal. The derivative of that first momentum is equal to some constant times the L2 norm of the initial data. Okay, because there is the conserved quantity. And therefore, the first momentum itself is just a linear expression in time. So it's a strictly increasing function for non-zero initial data, of course. So what happens is that if we show that there are two times wiggle, T1 wiggle and T2 wiggle, where this first momentum vanishes, then because this is linear increasing, so it just should happen that the solution should be with L2 norm equals to zero, and therefore the solution itself should be zero, okay? So that's like one of the interesting things that we have for this first momentum. And well, that's what we end up trying to, to show you here in a brief sketch. And for the worst term that I mentioned, so you notice this was the E1, and remember we still have to compute alpha derivatives. So for this uh, term, we see that we try to isolate the singularity at zero. So we just take the chi function, which is the cutoff at zero, and write down this expression as expression having the singularity, and another one that is in H1 for every time. OK, so that's this term arising here. You see, well, this will be bounded. This is with modulus 1. so is bounded that this is, of course, in L2. So it's pretty much easy that this is nice. But the, for the other term, for this one with the chi function, the localization at the origin, we just use that in that range for the decay, we have mean value 0 as a hypothesis, because the other result that says that you should suppose that. Therefore, just with this integration by parts, you get a new power of C here to kill 1. OK? So we end up just working with this CA minus 1 power. So we have to try to get that into L2 when we take the alpha derivatives. And therefore, well, we just end up with this expression here. And this is going to be in H1. So this is what turns out to be after this just substitution of that mean value 0 of the initial data. And well, this is just one expression for what is supposed to be left. And this is nice. I mean, you have to pay in order to estimate this in L2 with this pi halves of decay. And so we are pretty good because we are even more than four. And for the derivative, that will imply that this actually is in H1. Well, we get exactly almost the same decay as a constraint for that inequality. So we continue with the term with the singularity at the origin. And this is the term. So we now get rid of, of the exponential. We add and subtract 1 to get this expression out of there. And we use this uh, easy 
different, well, inequality that is shown in calculus that this difference between these two expressions is less than the angle, okay? And well, therefore, we get that everything in E1 in this original expression, the first term, is in H1 except for this one. But the singularity is isolated. So for the integral term, we also, well, have to do kind of the same computations and actually we will have to combine the smoothing effect that we have for this dispersive equation as well and the maximal function and get that, well, that, 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 that is gonna be okay. So we get also for the E5, that was the other term that I put in red, the same kind of behavior. So you see that E5 contains this power as well. So when we put uh, for the other terms that well, there were 11 terms for these ones. I mean, these are nice, they are in H1. So I won't just give too much details. Well, for, for the last one, which is the fourth derivative, you just replace this homogeneous derivative with the point-wise derivative. And you just work out and use the interpolation, the complex interpolation. You see here that you get this mixture of derivatives and decay, but you can put them separately and well, you end up with the regularity, I mean, in, in a good shape, and the decay that is also, well, what we have. So for those terms, we are okay. And that happens as well for four, seven, I mean, everything is, is working fine. Therefore, the singularity that was isolated was basically this one, and now this contains the alpha derivative that still was missing, okay? So we know that everything is in L2, okay, if and only if this is in L2. And now we are going to use some integration by parts and the evolution of the first momentum in order to get this expression. This is the nonlinearity here in the integral part of the Hamel's formula. And well, by Fourier transform properties, you get that this is actually the evolution of the first momentum. So we end up concluding that this expression, this alpha derivative times this average value in time of the first momentum is in L2, okay? At time T2, at, at the next time. So what we observe here is that for the values of A that we are working with, which are between one half and one, you just subtract here this alpha, okay? and you get that it will be a power minus one half, and that's not in L2, okay? So the only possible choice is to have this mean value, this average to be zero. And well, that's basically what is here. And therefore, if that average is zero, then we have to conclude that there is such a time that makes this uh, first momentum equals to zero. So. That's like the first T1 wiggle. Now then you have to reapply the same argument between T2 and T3, okay? But uh, it's interesting to notice that the, basically we got to this point where the average of the first momentum shows up, okay? So for the next result that says that you have a solution with the decay, let's say seven half plus A at two different times not being zero, okay? So what happens is that in that case, the value A wiggle is equal to one and you end up with this kind of similar expression. So this is supposed to be shown to be in L2, okay? At a different time from zero. And you see that almost a quite similar expression shows up and you end up with this average in time of the first momentum, okay? So because it's, it's completely explicit the expression, it was a linear function in T, then you get easily to this new one expression. You could just integrate in time and you get that it's a quadratic polynomial in T. So in order to guarantee that this is in L2, I mean, the problem here is that this is not in L2 with this regularity, okay? Then, well, you just Cho choose 
a time t star that makes this equals to zero, okay? And therefore, well, that that concludes the the proof of the of the theorem. I, I don't know. It's so thank you very much for your attention.